This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. If you enjoy Philosophy Bites, please support us. We're unfunded and all donations would be gratefully received. For more details, go to www.philosophybites.com. We want to be able to understand the world, but how do we know which statements we make about it are meaningful? Verificationists, such as the early 20th century group of philosophers and scientists known as the Vienna Circle, came up with a two-pronged test for meaningfulness, the verification principle. Take any statement. Ask, is it true by definition, like all cats are animals? That is, is it analytic? And if not, is it empirically verifiable? Can it be shown to be either true or false by some kind of experiment or observation? An example of this would be, all cats eat fish. A statement which is false and can easily be refuted by finding a cat that doesn't eat fish. But it's a meaningful statement nevertheless because it is testable. If a statement is neither true by definition nor empirically verifiable, then it is meaningless. Verificationism has rather fallen out of fashion now, but Liam Bright, a philosopher at the London School of Economics, is sympathetic towards it. Liam Bright, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Hi. We're talking today about verificationism. Let's start with a definition. What is verificationism? So verificationism is a thesis about how language works, and what it says is that for a claim to be cognitively meaningful, and I'll say what that means in a second, but for a claim to be cognitively meaningful, it needs to be such that it can be either confirmed or disconfirmed by sort of empirical evidence. We could make some observations and tell whether or not it's true, or it needs to be sort of logically or mathematically provable. And any claim which is neither confirmable by empirical evidence nor logically or mathematically provable is not meaningful according to verificationism. And so what does cognitively meaningful mean? Well, that's the claim that it's sort of capable of being either true or false. And so you could think we make some claims, like for instance, if I'm at a football match and my team scores, I might jump up and say yay or to make a sort of yay sound. That would be an example of a claim which is not cognitively meaningful. That's sort of the utterance I make when I jump up and say yay, it's not true or false, it's just a kind of expression of how I feel about the fact my team scored. Whereas if I say there's a cat on the map, well, that could be true if there's a cat on the map and false if there's not a cat on the map. And so that's an example of something cognitively meaningful. And the idea of verificationism is the cognitively meaningful claims are just those which we can gather evidence for, be it a proof or be it empirical evidence. Now, there was one group of philosophers who made the principle of verificationism famous, the Vienna Circle. But before we get to the circle, it does have a pre-circle history, doesn't it? Yes. Verificationism has a long and illustrious prehistory in philosophy. Maybe the most famous precursor to the verificationist idea is this passage in David Hume. David Hume was a famous empiricist. He thought that all knowledge has to derive from experience of the world. And he said that sort of once you're convinced of the empiricist principles he'd been arguing for, you would go through your library and you'd see of the books in there, do they contain reasoning concerning matters of fact and experience? You might think of that as things you can get empirical evidence for. Or do they contain reasons about sort of the relationship between ideas? You might think of that as something like things we can logically or mathematically prove. And if it's neither, then you commit them to the flames because they can contain nothing but sophistry or illusion. David Hume wasn't phrasing this exactly as a thesis about meaning, but it's clearly in the same ballpark as the verificationist idea. Also, the American pragmatists, maybe especially Peirce, were barking up some of the same trees, like had some of these same ideas. The Vienna Circle then come along, and there are a group of philosophers in Vienna, and we think of the Circle as being active for about a dozen years from the mid-1920s. And verificationism was really a central plank to their philosophy, wasn't it? Yes. So nowadays in philosophy, when we talk about verificationism, we mainly associate it with the Vienna Circle. So who were they and what role did it play? Well, the Vienna Circle were a group of scientists and intellectuals in Vienna, as you say. What they were interested in was the new results in foundations of mathematics and physics coming out at the time. In fact, many of them were mathematicians or physicists by like where they got their PhD. And they were sort of very impressed with the way in which the new logic developed by Bertrand Russell and Gottlob Frege and a bunch of, sort of luminaries in the very early 20th century and late 19th had allowed people to deal with much more claims logically, encompass a much broader swathe of science and mathematics using logic. And they came to think that 
maybe anything you could legitimately say without relying on empirical evidence would be demonstrable using this new logic, that ultimately this logic would capture everything we can say which doesn't rely on empiricist or empirical reasoning. And on that grounds, they worked their way into developing the theory that ultimately the meaningful claims about the world would divide into two, those which we could prove using the new logic, and there would be those which empirical science still covered, and there's nothing else remaining because all of the good work is being done by these new mathematical or logical tools we have available to us, or by good empirical science. And on this rock, they built their house. It turns out that if you take this idea seriously, it has very radical or far-reaching claims for like what can be done philosophically and what can't be. Well, explain a bit more about that. Their opponents were metaphysicians. Who in particular, and what aspects of metaphysics were they trying to combat? Who were their opponents? So there was at the time in Central Europe a kind of post-Hegelian stream of philosophy which built a lot of claims on quite abstruse metaphysical reasoning where people would make grand claims about the nature of the universe and the nature of society using claims which didn't seem like they could be proven logically or mathematically and weren't the kind of claims which were subject to empirical evidence. This was in many ways the philosophical mainstream and also theological mainstream of the time, and that was who they were attacking. Most famously, there was a conflict between the circle, maybe especially Rudolf Carnap, who was a member of the circle, and Martin Heidegger. So Martin Heidegger was and is a very famous philosopher who had built his philosophy around claims about our experience of the nothing, the way in which people experience nothingness in their life, which could be construed as thinking of a real presence out there, which we sometimes make contact with, which gives us a feeling of dread or anxiety. And the circle, Rudolf Carnap especially, really honed in on this as an example of just the kind of thing they didn't like. This talk of the nothing as an entity, it's not the sort of thing which we could do empirical science about, there's no science of the nothing. And so for the circle, this is a paradigm example of something which is not too profound for science or logic, it's just nonsense. So you've explained the principle very clearly. Something had to be true by definition or it had to be amenable to evidence in some way, otherwise it was cognitively meaningless. I want to talk about some objections to the principle. First, it seems very sweeping. I mean, it seems to rule out ethics, aesthetics, theology... An ethical claim, for example, like you shouldn't murder, is not true by definition, nor can it be verified. So does that mean that ethical claims are somehow put into a garbage can, marked meaningless? Evocative image. Um, it rather depends who you were talking to. So there were actually some members of the Vienna Circle, and I have in mind here Schick in particular, who did think that actually ethical claims were going to turn out to be empirically the sort of things we could confirm, because what they thought ethics was doing is in the business of making claims about psychology or sociology and sort of what ultimately leads to happy lives for us or something like that. So sometimes they went the rather heroic route of trying to argue that ethics is meaningful and it's an empirical science and we can discover what makes us happy and that's what ethics is about. But for the most part, that isn't the path they went. They tended to instead say that it has a kind of meaning, just not cognitive meaningfulness. So when we make ethical claims, we're doing something else of our language, not making claims which have purchased the truth. I mentioned earlier the example of cheering for my football team. And so it might be that just like I'm happy when Arsenal score, when someone does something which I might say is morally good, really what I'm doing is cheering them on, giving expression to the feeling of appropriation or um, approval I have towards their action. That was one theory. Another thing is ethics might be more like commands, where what I'm doing when I make an ethical claim is I'm telling you to do that thing or not do that thing accordingly. So if I say it's wrong to kill, what I'm saying is commanding you, don't kill. If someone says close the door, that doesn't have to be true or false. You're not making a claim about how the door is, which could be right or wrong. What you're saying is do something now. Now, in ethics, they were often keen to recapture it in some sense and give an account of what's going on in ethical reasoning, which would make sense of roughly what people are doing here. While they don't think it's cognitively meaningful, nor are they saying you should throw it in the bin, rather they're saying it's performing a different linguistic, psychological or social role from claims which might be true or false. 
In other cases, like theology, they were much more dismissive. They did have something like the attitude of throw it in the bin. Carnap, in his polemic against Heidegger, famously ends the polemic by saying that metaphysicians are musicians without musical talent. What the good analogue to metaphysics is, is giving expression to our attitude to life or like the overall way we experience the world. But the way to do that properly is through poetry and music, things which don't misleadingly appear to be true or false, but rather just get straight to directly expressing the emotional experience you're trying to go for. And so he thought metaphysics, and he would have said theology too, are just very misleading ways of doing this thing. They're actively deceptive in some sense. They don't let you know what's actually going on. Often their critique of metaphysics went along with a kind of socio-political critique where they thought that what metaphysics allowed one to do was prop up bad regimes by saying some words which have this sort of misleading appearance of arguing that things have to be this way or that it's good that they are this way in some strong metaphysical sense. But that's an illusion used to prevent us from being able to properly reason about our social situation and what we might want to do about it. Another objection to verificationism is what is to count as verification. To give one example, how does it cope with history and disputes between historians? I mean, suppose we make a claim about the past. I don't know whether Henry VIII liked his eggs well-boiled. I don't know if they had boiled eggs in Tudor times. I guess they did. And suppose we don't have any evidence for that claim either way. Does that mean the claim about Henry VIII and the boiled eggs is meaningless? Well, it's a great question, and it sort of really gets to the heart of some of the issues which bedeviled the logical empiricists. The claims, for instance, Henry VIII, like boiled eggs, they strongly seem like the kind of thing which we mean to rule in here, right? We happen not to have any evidence regarding Henry VIII, but it's surely not the kind of thing which is not verifiable in principle, because if we were there at the relevant timeline, we could just ask or whatever and have some means of finding out Henry VIII's attitude to boiled eggs on the assumption that they were boiled eggs then. Some logical empiricists just took that route. They just said, well, what we mean by something being verifiable is that it's verifiable in principle. There is some observation that could in principle be possible for us to make, which would rule the claim in or rule it out, even if we're not going to be in a position to do that and maybe never will be in a position to do that. But that's at least a little bit worrying from a verificationist point of view, because this talk of like, we could do it, that gets us involved in what's called modal talk, talk of what's possible and impossible. And that looks worryingly like claims which aren't going to pass the verificationist test, right? They look like they're claims which are neither logically demonstrable nor empirically provable, and that's going to be a worry for us. And so one thing that happened is the verificationists, again, Rudolf Carnap especially, became sort of pioneers in modal logic, the logic of reasoning about what's possible and what's necessary and what could happen, etc. The other route is to go hardcore and say, nope, we're going to rule those claims out too. And it just turns out that history, strictly speaking, just concerns those things about which we could plausibly gain empirical evidence. Now, of course, you know, one shouldn't bet against the ingenuity of historians and maybe finding ways to evince things. But in the end, it might end up ruling out things as meaningful, which sort of intuitively are meaningful. So that option is available, but I, I don't think that turned out to be very popular, partly because exactly the case of history that is something they discussed but also there are going to be bits of physics for instance which feel like they're the sort of thing we want to be able to test and make claims about but which don't currently lie within experimental reach of us and they certainly didn't want to rule things like that out they didn't want to rule out innovation in physics on the whole they tried to avoid ruling out vast waves of apparently empirical science and instead move to the slightly weaker form of verificationism where it's about what could be verified in principle but in that way they could absorb questions about things that might be taking place in another galaxy, claims about what might be happening in another galaxy, which we can't currently verify, but in principle, if we were to build the appropriate spaceship, we might be in the future. Exactly so. We can make claims about the presence of life on an exoplanet, which presently we're incapable of reaching. And that's meaningful, not because we can currently test those claims, but just because we know in principle what it would take to be able to do that. We'd have to be able to reach the planet and then perform certain kind of tests for like the presence of micro life forms or whatever. And the fact that we know in principle what it would take is enough to make the claim meaningful, even if right now we can't actually do that. Perhaps the most famous criticism of verificationism is that it's self-defeating. After all, the principle of verificationism itself 
is neither true by definition nor is it verifiable. So can it survive scrutiny from its own criteria? Yes. Now, this is the thing which people usually take to have defeated verificationism. And so it's often surprising to people that when you read the verificationists themselves, they weren't that worried about this. It rarely comes up. It's not a thing they discuss that often. And I think that gets to one of the ways in which the project of the Vienna Circle is more radical than people actually appreciate. As I mentioned, the verificationists don't mind saying that there are some forms of language which aren't truth apt, but they're still doing something for us sociolinguistically. The pertinent example here is commands. If I tell you, close the door, they don't think that's true or false, but they do think it's a thing you might want to say because it plays this other linguistic role of instructing you. As far as I can tell, their attitude to the principle of verification is something like the following. We can command people or sort of recommend to them, to put it in a more friendly, democratic way of putting it, we can recommend to people that they adopt a language which would make the verification criteria analytic. It would make it true by definition in that language. I can say to you, henceforth, speak in a way wherein your claims are either such that they can be given empirical evidence for or against them, or they can be proven or disproven logically or mathematically. And when I say that, that's like close the door. It's not true or false, of course, but it's a recommendation. And if you obeyed that recommendation, then you'd be speaking a language in which the verification criteria itself would be analytic, and so it would pass its own test. The radicalism here is there's a strong conventionism or relativism there. Like what that amounts to is saying is you can sort of decide whether or not metaphysical claims, which are apparently sort of deeply significant, you can sort of rule them out by fiat, by just saying, henceforth, we won't speak a language which makes sense of them, the end. And a lot of people think that's a really inappropriate way to relate to those claims. We can't just decide whether or not there is a God is meaningful by just declaring we're going to speak in a certain kind of way. And sort of the radicalism of the Vienna Circle is they were very aware of this conventionist or relativistic consequence of their views, and they just embraced it. So there might be a language in which verificationism didn't play this central role. And as you say, they were recommending that it did so. So why? What was so great about verificationism? What function did it serve, given that they could imagine a society in which it played no such role? My read on this situation is the sort of the pragmatic concerns, socio-ethical and scientific in a certain sense, came first for them. And the reason we were adopting the verification criteria is because it's good or useful to do so. It embodied purposes which they thought were worth pursuing, which they hoped we'd pursue too. So why do I think that? So for one thing, three members of the Vienna Circle, Otto Neurath, Hans Hahn and Rudolf Carnap, they wrote a manifesto together where at one point they discuss what it is they think they're doing as the Vienna Circle. And as to the question of like why adopt this way of looking at things, they more or less just say because it embodies the attitude of the future, something like that. The masses are coming to adopt socialism, and with socialism they're coming to adopt a kind of materialism. And so to some extent they thought it was part of a large socio-cultural change we were undergoing and it was a good one they were themselves socialists they welcomed that change and so part of like helping bring about this new world was adopting verificationism precisely because it rules out as metaphysical nonsense a lot of the claims which they would have thought of as very regressive of metaphysicians like Heidegger. And so partly it was like on those kinds of socio-political grounds. And also partly I think there's a scientific practical rationale. They were very impressed by the example of Einstein, who had come to great insights about physics, about simultaneity, by thinking through the question of like, how would I actually test whether or not two events happen simultaneously? And that allowed Einstein to make great progress. And they thought that in general, the sciences would really benefit by people asking themselves these questions and thinking, how would I actually test this? I'm not going to let my claim in unless I can work out what kind of things would count as evidence for or against it. OK, there's obviously a lot more to say about verificationism, but I want to discuss it in relation very briefly to three famous philosophers, each of whom lived in Vienna or visited Vienna when the circle was meeting. The first is Karl Popper, who was never invited to become a member of the circle. He came up with what he saw as an alternative in a way to verificationism, which was falsification. I wonder if you can explain what the difference is. Yes, yeah, so Karl Popper rather famously said of himself that if you have to ask who killed logical positivism, the worldview of the Vienna Circle, he would confess it was me, I did it. And so he really thought of himself as a marked rival to them. 
in a way that they never did. They always thought of him as just someone who's engaged in broadly the same project, but looking at things from a slightly different angle. Popper was very interested in what differentiated empirical inquiry from pseudo-empirical inquiry, from forms of looking into world which aren't really properly tethered to empirical evidence, which people often say is a demarcation between science and non-science. And the way Popper formulated this demarcation was that properly empirical claims, so what we might call scientific claims, are falsifiable. They are things which, if we looked into getting evidence for them, we could discover that they're false. So we could rule them out using empirical evidence. Now, Popper wasn't trying to differentiate meaningful claims from non-meaningful claims. So he was trying to divide a slightly different thing from what the positivists were trying to divide. But that said, since the logical positivists did think that what was meaningful and what was capable of admitting of scientific inquiry were going to line up in this way, there's clearly some connection. So Popper is focusing on how we can tell if something's false, whereas verificationism is in some sense like how we can tell if something is true. And Popper didn't think that was appropriate. He strongly resisted attempts to say that what we could do in science is work out what's true or more likely to be true or something like that. He really thought that science is just in the business of ruling claims out, like that's all we can get up to. The dispute between the logical positivists and Popper or Popperianism became, are there means of sort of working out what's more likely to be true or can science only ever just rule things out? And that was the main dispute between them and they all went to their graves disagreeing about that. It was never really resolved between them. That was Popper. The second philosopher we should talk about is Quine, who visited the Vienna Circle for a few months, and he really launched what he considered, and many considered to be, a mortal blow against the Circle by claiming that something the Circle took for granted, the analytic synthetic distinction, was not as easy to draw as the Circle believed. Yeah, so professional philosophers will often think of the Quinean attack on uh, the Vienna Circle, logical positivism, and verificationism as the decisive intellectual blow against them. Quine argued that the verificationists were relying on this distinction, as you say, between analytic and synthetic statements. And the idea is we can say that some statements are made true by their meaning or by relationships between ideas or something like that. And other statements are such we need to gain empirical evidence for them. And it's because we can make that distinction that we can tell which of the statements are the kind of statements which we should be trying to prove mathematically or logically, and which of the statements are the kind of statements which we should be trying to gain evidence for empirically through observation or whatnot. And Quine thought that, in fact, this distinction isn't really tenable, and so there's no way of getting the verificationist criteria off the ground insofar as it's relying on that distinction. Is it possible to give an example of the kind of thing which he thought was problematic? An example you can point to where the distinction between analytic and synthetic is not easy to tease apart? Well, it's kind of hard to do that because for Quine, in some sense, it's every claim. And because what Quine ended up saying was that our theory faces experience as a whole. A body of knowledge is like always everywhere being tested by any given experience. And so I gave, for example, earlier, the cat is on the map as an example of the sort of claim you might want to say is true or false, depending on whether we can gain empirical evidence for it. Even claims like that, you could, in principle, upon gaining evidence for it, which seems to just confirm it, walking into the room, seeing the map, and there's no cat on it, you could revise anything in your worldview to try and accommodate that. Maybe I'm hallucinating right now, or maybe cats have just gained a new power, which allows them to teleport away instantaneously or appear invisible. And so there is a cat on the mat there in some sense, but I'm just not unable to see it right now. And to make sense of these claims, I'd need to change what I thought of the laws of physics, change how I thought my sensory apparatus worked. But if you made all of the right adjustments at the right moments, you could eventually accommodate the cat is on the mat and is consistent with the experience I'm having right now. And so even for very basic claims like that, he thought there's no real sense in which there's like some clear way I'm sort of confirming or disconfirming it through experience versus unable to do that. Anything can be defended or not defended in light of the right kind of adjustments to our total theory of everything. And so he thought that rather than sort of think at things on the level of which individual claims are provable or not provable or analytic or synthetic, rather we should be thinking about sort of properties of our total worldview. For Quine, looking at individual claims is the wrong level of analysis. 
I see. Now, let's turn to the third philosopher I think we should name check, and that's Freddie Eyre, A.J. Eyre. It was Eyre's 1936 book, Language, Truth and Logic, which really popularised the circle's ideas in the Anglo-American world, at least. And I read that book when I was 18, and I've been hooked on philosophy ever since. I wondered what you thought about his influence on how verificationism has been presented and received. Yes, I should actually say, but I'd also read that book, Language, Truth and Logic, before I went to university, and so probably it's to blame for me being here right now. So I has a lot to answer for. That book was incredibly influential in the English-speaking world. It probably became the defining image of logical positivism for many people. And it has many virtues as a book. Like, it very clearly expounds the central doctrines. Aya pulls no punches. He sort of delights in pointing out all of the various claims which have held to have been very true and very important. He loves sort of deflating them, and that kind of gave people a sense of at least some of the radicalism of this project. It should be said that Aya often had a kind of slightly cruder version of the theories than other people. So often scholars get grumpy about Aya basically because they feel he oversimplified things. That said, it gets people into philosophy, and I still enjoy the book. So. There's something to be said if you want to have a readable introduction to sort of the basics of what verification is about. Readers should go and check out Language, Truth and Logic. It's still in print now because it's such a big seller. Much later, he was famously asked what was wrong with logical positivism. And he said something like, well, the main defect was that almost all of it was false. Yeah, and in that regards, Ayer is reflecting what I think is the mainstream of philosophical thought, that this project was sort of bold and interesting, but between being high spice and batar and just in general having difficulty of all these cases, it never really worked out. Now, it didn't entirely go away, so there are a number of philosophers who maintain some sympathy for it, myself amongst them. Afterwards, very famously, Michael Dummett has views which are at least in the realm of verificationism at some points. Kwame Appiah has at times expressed sympathy for stuff which is, again, in the realm of verificationism. You will get philosophers who have some sympathy for verificationism, and if I have my way, there's going to be a big revival. But for now, I is expressing the mainstream view that it just died because it was wrong. Liam Bright, thanks very much indeed. Thanks for having me. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us. We now have two more podcasts. Nigel has one on philosophers and places they're associated with, www.philosophysites.com, and I have a podcast devoted specifically to moral and political philosophy, www.philosophy247.org. Mm-hmm.